pray for this morning that God will be glorified. So, Lord, thank you for this, this gathering of men. This is, a, this is a great group of guys. We are so, so blessed and honored to have them here today. And, Lord, I, every one of them has a father, and every one of them, many of them are fathers or grandfathers or great-grands. And I pray, Lord, today that you'll use this message, this very specific message for fathers in our life today, and that, Lord, you be glorified, that you be honored, and you be lifted up in praise. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Damien Cooper, bring it on, brother. Good morning. I don't know if I'm just getting shorter or this table's getting taller, but every time I come, I used to get like getting higher and higher to my chest. I am not that tall. I'm not a damn back there, man. Like just, whew. But, man, well, I will tell you one thing is that, man, God is good. And all the time, man, I just want to say thank you. Again, it's always an honor and a privilege to be up here speaking and asking the Lord what that looks like. And I know one moment, that as Rod, as he shared with me, he said, hey, could you speak about this, what you shared with my son? And before I even get into those details, I knew, and you're probably going to hear it over and over and over again until September 23rd when he leaves Sherman Smith, but show me the father changed my life. It changed, of course, of the relationship I have with my own father. It changed the aspect of as a father myself. It convicted me, it transformed me, and it helped me reconcile some things with my father. I had an opportunity to see my father this weekend as I was traveling to Hayes, Kansas. We had a show and was doing ministry for the whole weekend up there. And then on the way back, I even got a bonus. I got to see my grandfather as well. And so I got to see my grandfather and my father on the same porch. And it was really cool and really amazing. But man, one thing I realized is this, is that when God gives you something, you must share it. But also there may be times that you keep it in dear to your heart and you let it marinate in your heart in your mind until he asks you to deliver that. And I remember when Rod was asking, he said, hey, if you guys have any notes or wisdom or guidance that you want to give to my son, I know I was gone, I was on the road again that weekend and he had people come over to his house on the driveway, but I knew I wanted to share some things with Derek. I only met him once or twice my whole entire time. I've been here in Kansas City. We not had more than a five minute conversation, but I knew we were born one week apart. We both will be fathers, we're both in ministry. And so, so what would be cool is, to give him an acronym because I know how much Rod loves acronyms. We all know how much Rod loves acronyms in this place, right? And one thing I realized, I said, you know what? I'm going to do something that is dear to his father as well that could be really cool for him to take on. He can hold on to it for the rest of his life and that we can keep each other accountable. So this is where the message comes from. But before we get into the message, though, we have to honor one father, and that's the Heavenly Father. Because the message is Father's Day every day. And our Heavenly Father has a Father's Day every single day. So can we give God some praise and thanksgiving in this place this morning and honor our Father for loving us and being gracious to us and loving us in such a magnificent way. He is a good, good Father. That is who he is. And Jesus demonstrated the way we should honor and love our Heavenly Father. And everything that Jesus did was to glorify his Father alone. So this morning, I, I've been going through a whole text, and as, as you know, Greg, he'll go through a whole book in two years. But the thing is, I realized that, you know, let's talk about a specific topic. Let's hit on some specific points when I'm talking about with Derek this morning. So the first letter is this. We're going to jump right into it. It's faith. And you're like, oh, that's ironic. That's cliche. But no, faith is huge when it comes to being a father. Your faith is key for your child to know who Jesus is in their life. There's nothing better than seeing your toddler love Jesus and sing a song about Jesus. I remember when I was three years old, my mother put a soccer ball right into my foot and I became really good at it. To the point I traveled around the world with it and played for my college. And it was really awesome. But I remember taking a soccer ball, putting it right there to my daughter's foot when she was three years old. But before I even put a soccer ball to her foot, I talked about Jesus with her when she came into this world. And when she was three years old and she's standing on stage and she's singing happy birthday, Jesus, it was just an overwhelming emotions with me, knowing the fact that saying, Lord, this is what I choose, that my house will choose to serve you and serve you only. 
And it was beautiful for that moment, knowing, watching only my three-year-old at the time, which is four, and now my two-year-old loving Jesus as well. And I get to welcome my son Creed this next month. We're excited for that. So be praying for my wife and my family as we welcome our baby boy next month. We're excited for that. And my first son that I've been praying for. And I'm going to tell you one thing. And I'm not, I don't know, this is for someone in this room. God does give the desires of your heart. He does. It may not be your timing, but he does. And I learned that God had to cultivate and God had to transform me. God had to change. God had to say, you have to reconcile some things with your father if you truly want to be a father to your son. Because you cannot bring the wounds. You cannot bring the hurt. You cannot bring the pain. And how can you parent godly in such an effective way if you carry it into your son's life? And so God allowed me to have two beautiful girls and to learn how to be a parent and learn how to be a father, learn how to be patient. So when my son comes into this world, that the other two girls, yes, and my daughter, Briella, she got it the hardest because I was just, I was my prime, first time being a parent, but my son will have an opportunity because my faith has been increased. Hebrews 11 of chapter, it's a chapter of faith. It also talks about how faith is the greatest power that we can have in this world. It's the greatest power that we can have as well. One key responsibility we have as fathers is that do we confidently obey God's word with faith that is in action? And when our kids see us, do we live faith in action? What is being talked about? What is being displayed within our homes? Abram showed Isaac by opening and being obeying God's commands, and God provided Abraham the sacrifice to replace his son. And imagine you taking your kids. Would you obey God? And have faith in action and walking up to the mountain and saying, I have to sacrifice my son because this is what the Lord says. And that's how much faith that you have in trusting that the Lord can bring him back to life. And that's what Abraham was thinking. But the Lord provided for him because of his faithfulness. And do we have that type of faith that every time we go and have the conversations with our kids, what type of conversation are you having with your kids right now? Are you having faith talks? You have a lot of kids in this room. You have fathers and grandfathers. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to say it probably three times in this message. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers and all you grandfathers in this room. It is an important piece in our life. And I'm so grateful to be a father myself. But how many faith talks do we have? Shoot, let's look at the list right here that you're telling them right now. They don't need surgery. That God can heal them. That before they step into the operation room, that God will remove that cancer. That God will heal that dislocated shoulder. Or yet that, that they can't spell, that they can't talk, that they don't look like they're a nobody, but they actually have a gifting. That they can get that scholarship, that they can make that sports team, that they can get that job or promotion, that they can get that house or a car that they've been praying for, that they can have that child for they've been looking, longing for for five years and you've been praying with them. Or yet that they can't be released from prison. And that's something I'm having a faith talk with my brother already in this moment. That serving 25 years, that you can't be released from prison by faith alone. Why? Because you're speaking faith and acting by faith in your home, in your marriage, in your parenting, and in your ministry. The second letter is this, attention. Attention. And I'll be honest, I've struggled with this time to time because my attention span is very short at times. And I'll be real, because as an athlete, you have to be paying attention, but you have to be paying attention to the next play. So I'm constantly looking for the next thing to do because as a soccer, as a forward, if I'm not thinking three passes ahead, then I'm not going to be in a position to score. And so as a father, sometimes I, need, I don't need to be thinking three days ahead. I just need to be in that moment with my child. And that's what can be hard sometimes to differentiate between an athlete and as a father. And I realized that saying I need to pay attention because one of the most important things in the, as an aspect of the parenting is your child wants attention. Attention leads to direction. Attention leads to direction. If you give your attention to your child, your child will respond. But if your attention is elsewhere, your child may be as well. Where is your attention of your child right now? Are they having conversation with you? Are they connecting with you? Are they wanting to spend time with you? Have they been making signs of saying, hey, I've been crying out or I've been doing things and maybe some of them have been acting out because all they want is attention in their life. So make sure you have attention and their presence at home when you're at home. We shared yesterday and we heard it multiple times. Rob shared it, other men have shared it. The real work starts when we walk into our home and we spend time with our wife, we spend time with our kids. That's when the real work happens. 
See, Psalms 116.2 says, because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. See, this is powerful because here's a God that's so responsive by the attention that he gives us when we cry out to him and we spend time in prayer. I was sharing Rod this morning. I said, Rod, I was on a walk and I get up 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning because that's just my mental alarm clock now, training players at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I realized one thing is saying, Lord, I just need something in my life right now. And that's more of you. Lord, there's things going on in my life. I need to trust you. And the things I was praying for when I got in the car to come here this morning, I didn't have my radio on. It was on a different station. The Lord said, turn it to this station. And I turn it to the station this morning as I'm driving. And it was in the beginning of the song. It was literally in the middle of the song, specifically the lyrics that I was praying for was the lyrics I was praying on the radio this morning. You can't tell me that God ain't paying attention. You can't tell me that God is saying, you know what? I am near to you. And that is something that we can take as a father ourselves here on earth. Are we paying attention to the cries and to the conversations that our children are having with us? See, my wife has hit me on the shoulder. She has hit me on the head. She's even screamed at me saying, Damien, your child is trying to talk to you. Because I'm so focused on, you know, I'm on my phone, doing an email, looking at sports. And we all can be guilty of that. Checking the Chiefs score, checking anything going on, the hockey, anything. We're checking the news. But yet, are you have your attention span that can really say, you know what? Nothing else matters. My grandchild's right in front of me, and I want to play with them. See, that's what's important. But what is so important in your life that it replaces the time you have with your child? What is so important in your life in this moment that it replaces the time you have with your wife and with your children? See, those are God moments that God bends down and he listens to us. And when was the last time you had a bend down moment with your child, with your grandchild, that you got on a knee and you just started having a conversation with them? Or you tickled him or you say, hey, let's go outside. You say, you know what? I'm going to move from the couch. I'm going to get on the floor. We're going to pull out a board game. We're just going to play a game. My attention is here and not elsewhere. When is that last time you had that bend down moment? There's a song by Matthew West, The Beautiful Things We Miss. And there's part of the lyrics in there. And I'm, again, being an artist myself and traveling doing music, lyrics mean a lot to me. And I was, I was listening to the song for the first time. You guys know the story. I shared it before when I was traveling down the interstate and I, was, I left my wife and my two girls where they were at in the other city. And the Lord said, you got to turn around. You can worry about ministry later. And I, when I turned around, the song came on and I started bawling. And I remember it was like a movie. I pulled into the driveway, opened my door, ran up to the front door, knocked and my four-year-old starts crying because daddy's home. Daddy's right here. And let's read the lyrics. It says, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to look back someday and find everything that really mattered was right in front of me this whole time. Open my eyes, Lord. Keep me in the moment just like this before the beautiful things we love become the beautiful things we miss. Take that in. Look at those lyrics. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to look back someday and find Everything that really mattered was right in front of me this whole time. Open my eyes, Lord. Keep me in the moment just like this before the beautiful things we love become the beautiful things we miss. And are you missing those moments right now in your life? Have you missed those moments already? Did you miss them when they were three, when they were four, when they were 12, when they were 17, when they were 21? But it's not too late, man. It is not too late. I'm 27 years old, and I'm reconciling my relationship with my father. Do I have to go 60, 70% to make that happen? Yeah. But for me to go 60, 70% is going 100% for my child. Because I know what it's worth. I know what the value can bring. Even if your son is 23, your daughter is 23, or 44, or 45, 56, or 72, it's never too late. There's some of you in this room right now. Think about your child right now in this moment. When's the last time I talked to him? What's the last conversation I had with him? When was the last godly conversation I had with him? When was the last time we celebrated something together? It's not too late, men. 
which goes into my the letter T, time. Time, as we know, is a non-renewable source. We don't get it back. It does expire. You can't go back what happened Tuesday. We can't go back what happened Monday. We can't go back what happened this weekend. Only way we can continue to do is moving forward. And I always hear it saying, why always look in the rearview mirror and just actually look through the windshield, knowing that everything you do is always pointing forward. Your eyes, your nose, everything, your body is completely pointing forward. So why keep looking back? You can cherish those moments, but you're going to constantly continue to move forward. See, be intentional in spending time with your little one. And you're like, oh, my kid is 65 years old. My kid is 45 years old. They ain't little. They taller than me. There's still a little one in your heart. And to them, there's still a little one to you. Because they mean that much to you. With your wifey, how much time are you spending with her? And time tells others how much value they are to you. So when you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time on date nights, when you spend time with your kids, is it actually truly quality time right now? And I just share what is so important that it replaces the time you have with your children and with your wife. Maybe right now, write down on your piece of paper. What is it that is taking and replacing the time I have with my children? Is it work? Is it ministry? Is it relationships? Is it greed? What is it that is replacing the time you have right now with your children? And are you spending immeasurable time with God? That sometimes you just lose yourself in the moment. And, as, and I'm, I'm, I shared a message a couple of weeks ago talking about, do you ask more questions or do you make more statements? And you're starting to see a little bit more even in the talks that I'm sharing is, it's more about more questions because it, it allows us to really think and get to a position, a place where we are in our lives to saying, what do I truly want? Am I longing to understand a personal relationship with Jesus? Am I longing to understand that God, you have something really cool and really amazing? Some of you saying, man, my time is almost short. No, it's not. God is giving you breath in your lungs this morning. So he obviously still has a mission for you today. What is that mission, man? Is it the mission to reach out to your grandchild? Is it the mission to reach out to your son or to your daughter or to all your kids? And maybe saying, you know what, man, I need to take some time with them. And does spending time with God affect the time you have with your kids? Yes, and absolutely. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because if you go on a trip and spend time and you do ministry, you pour out, you pour out, and you pour out, and you don't spend time with God, you're going to come home and you're going to be exhausted. You're going to be tired. You're going to be burnt out. And you're going to have a short fuse. Don't bother me. I don't want to talk. I used to tell my wife, hey, babe, I'm down the road. Can I just have a day just to recover? No, 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 no. I don't get time back. And if I'm giving all it out to everyone else I'm ministering to and none for my family, then what's the priority? What's the priority in my life? And if busyness has control of your life, then the time will not exist in your home or in your parenting. And think about the times you've been distant. Think about the times that you've been bothered or been annoyed. Is it because of busyness and because of burnt out or just your priorities wasn't in the right place? The time you spend with your kids will also dictate the direction they will go. Proverbs 22, 6, dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. And the values they learn from you will be with them for life. They will be with them for life. Dedicate your children to God. Have you dedicated your children? I'm not just talking about you getting up with your wife and you invited your mom and dad and, you know, everyone's here and you have your baby like this. Trust me, I, I was a pastor for four years in the church and we did baby dedication all the time. And you have your baby and we say, we're going to dedicate and the church stands up and they're going to commit and help to raise this kid up into the church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're at home, have you dedicated your child? When you're in the car, have you dedicated your child? When you're in a conversation, when you're at a sports game, everything you do is point them to Jesus. So all the values, the things that they hear, what they're saying from the conversation with your wife, the things they hear when you're talking to your boys, all the values that you have, the stuff you're chanting and sharing at the TV, all the values that you're displaying, does it point them to Jesus? Because they can only learn the values and the way of the kingdom is by spending time with you. And as you spend time with them, are you pointing them to Jesus? And I did this yesterday. I'm going to do it again today. Take your piece of paper and write your kids' name down. All your kids' name down. 
You got you got 12 kids, you're gonna be here for two minutes, right? On your kids' name. I'm not I'm not just asking for the first name, I'm not asking middle name, last name, because you'll be here for two hours doing that. Just write your kids' name down and then put a little dash next to it. What values are they living today? Are they living godly values or the worldly values? And be honest. I heard some of you have talked about my kid is not living way for the Lord. Put it there. He's living worldly values. Kids living godly values, put it down. And here's the thing. If they're living godly values, good job. You're not finished yet. Because the day we go before the Lord, everything we do on her on earth is continuing to point them back to Jesus. Some of you saying, well, they're at my house. I have no more. I, I can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And have the worldly values, that means you have a mission already itself. That is your mission as a father. It's to point them back to Jesus, to love them and encourage them as we'll get on going. But here's the next letter, humility. It will take humility. And when we as fathers come to God or our examples that we know that humble themselves, that we can receive wisdom and guidance, it is a game changer for us, men. And it's the humility that produces intimacy with our children. See, Jesus is humility, and we should be humility as well. And I've talked about it before that intimacy is information. And what kind of information are you getting from your children? Are they speaking things that are deep, or is it just pretty shallow? And based off, if it's deep or shallow, it's based off the intimacy you have with your child. So let go of your pride. Let go of that you feel like you have to know everything. Trust me, we all been there. We have our father moments. We have our man moments. Like, I'm the father. I'm the authority. So I'm going to put my hammer down. And this is the way it should go because I am right and you're wrong. We've been there. All of us has been there before. But yet, how we take a step back and say, you know what? Maybe I could have went in a different direction. Maybe I could have let go of my pride of putting the hammer down and saying, you know what? Even as your father, I can sit here and spend time with you and we can talk this thing out. Letting the Holy Spirit counsel you is a benefit for your family, for your whole entire family. When you allow the Holy Spirit to be the advocate and the counselor in your life. And have you asked the Holy Spirit to be the counselor? It's in scripture and he is living inside you. If you see Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But have you asked him saying, Holy Spirit, I need you to counsel me. Show me, teach me, convict me when I'm being tempted or I'm about to do things that can harm my children. This is one word that we can focus on forever for the rest of our life. Now, I probably use this scripture for 80% of all my messages. Why? Because it's so important. Philippians 2 is a scripture that we all as men should continue to focus on. It's about the imitation of Christ's likeness. See, Philippians 2, 3 to 5 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. If you don't value humility, you won't value your children. If you don't value humility, you won't value your children. You come home, whether it's popping a beer, getting a little pop, or getting your little drink, you're sitting right on the sofa, kicking your feet up. It sounds more like a godly thing of, I'm the God in this home. Rather than saying the first thing you come in the door is saying, how are you doing? How was your day? And I had to ask the Lord. The Lord has literally took some things and he really had to crush me. He literally had to put me in a pressure and squeeze the juice out of me. Because that one question my wife asked me the other day, and I mean when the other day, sometimes when I say the other day, it could be two days or it could be several years. But I remember her asking this question to me saying, man, why is it that every time you come in the door lately, that it's always about you? You never ask me how my day is going. I understand I'm your wife and I'm your biggest support and, and I'm here to support you. And I know you got a lot going on in your ministry, but I just, all I want is this one question is, Hey babe, how's your day? Maybe ask your kids, how's your day? And I'm telling you, even though they're eight, 13, 16, and I'm telling you when they get to teenagers, some of you think it's too late. I worked with teenagers for the last five years. I was a teenager. You was a teenager. They will open up. But have you given the space to open up? Have you given the permission to actually speak the hurt and the pain and to trust you as a father? And as father, it takes us denying our crosses, denying ourselves and picking up our crosses and following Jesus. 
It takes us denying ourselves, picking up our crosses, and following Jesus. Humility leads to intimacy. Intimacy leads to security. And security leads to eternity. What do you mean by that, Damien? See, when you humble yourself, that leads to a part of intimacy that you'll receive information from your child. And when they give you that information with your child, it leads to security. It means that they trust you, and that they know they can be protected by their father, which means that you can speak life words into them, which leads to internal difference. That's what's, it's a process, man. It's a whole entire process that we forget. Let this be the way of your child. E, encourage, encourage. I mean, I love watching my kids have a huge smile on their face when I take some time and to encourage them, to pump them up. And you guys have those moments as well when you're just in the room and you're in their bedroom and you're getting them all hyped, especially the moments when the mom's got them already brushed their teeth and they got them all dressed for bed and it's nine o'clock at night. And you come in and say, let's go. And you just woken them up in and they're not going to bed for two hours. I've done that. I recommend on doing that. Hi, Louie came over with my, my four-year-old the other day and I was like, Baby, you look good. You awesome. You want to go swimming tomorrow? She was like this, like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. She's like, really? I'm going to have to sleep. I said, pieces. I'll, I'll go get some groceries. But no, I remember saying, you got this, baby girl. You're amazing. You're beautiful. You're both are world changers. And that lights them up. Even though they're four and two, it lights them up. Imagine when they're 25 and 27. And you're telling the world changers that they're beautiful, that they're amazing, that they're awesome, that they are a warrior that they are strong, that they are chosen, that they are redeemed. I'm telling you, those words matter. First Thessalonians 5 11 talks about that. It really shares to us, encourage one another, build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So just as Christians, we are called to build one another up, to talk about each other and to encourage one another and say, you know what, you can do this. We need to do that to our children. See, when times feel exhausting and when they feel exhausted, when they feel down, when they're putting their head down, when they're mad, when they're frustrated, your words matter. Your words matter. Because now I'm talking from the 16-year-old Damien that I didn't have a father, that when I needed him the most, when I didn't have a good game, or you know what, man, I didn't do well on this test. And all I wanted is my father to say, man, you're awesome, son. That's just one game. One game doesn't dictate who you are in Christ. Even though I didn't have that moment, God has put godly men in my life that I see as father figures that pour into me. But I promise you this, and you can keep me accountable. I promise you this, I'm making it away. That when my daughters, and my daughter already, she's four years old, and she's looking at herself, I'm like, you're four, you're not even 13 yet. And she's looking at herself like, daddy, do I look pretty? I'm like, girl, you're beautiful no matter what dress you put on. You are beautiful. And it's crazy that this world, that even at four years old, they're already thinking about, do they look good enough in a dress? It's crazy. But when I tell her she's beautiful, it, it just lightens her up and just says, man, my daddy sees me. He loves me. Be sensitive to your children and their need for encouragement. Trust me, they will love you, they will trust you, and they will count you even more by being the positive words in their life. Speak God's truth in their life. And this last one is right here, R, response. And I'm going to hit on this one hard because the Lord, boy, I'm going to tell you one now, my daughter tried to test me yesterday on this word. Response is huge. I've seen it on the sideline on sports. I've seen it in the church, how parents respond to children. And let me tell you, when you respond with hate, with anger, with lash out, they will withdraw, they will disconnect. Trust me, I'm constantly having a conversation with teenagers right now because their parents are constantly nagging at them on the sideline. My dad expects me to do this, my dad expects me to do that. I'm telling you, man, whatever comes out of our mouth has matter to it, has weight to it. You can give them a look and there's weight to it already. You know, we all have that dad look. Keep doing that. I don't have to say a word. My daughter knows. Both my daughters know. The other day, my daughter, I'm, I had to tell you this, it's funny. Because I told her, stop doing it, because she had a cup, just like this, and had a cup on it. And she kept pushing in, kept pushing in. There's water. And she was by the PlayStation 4. I'm telling you right now, that's my PlayStation 4. I don't play with that. All right? And I knew if she tipped that cup, the wires could get messed up. So she did it. She's looking at me like, no. So I just got up and looked at her. She goes, okay. 
and just walked out. Literally, you have weight to your words and to your posture and the position of your body. So how you respond matters. How you correct, how you give feedback, love and grace are two key ingredients to help navigate through issues and respond to difficult situations. The Heavenly Father is so gracious to us because his love is so overwhelming, man. Let that be the lifestyle for you. And this one, as I continue to talk about, do we have self-control? Can we control ourselves? Can we contain ourselves? The words we say, the actions that we do. Like I just said, have you lashed out? Have you had that anger moment, which has caused damage in your relationship with your child? How patient are you with your kids? And we must show grace and love to our kids. I just need to say it one more time. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Some of you may not even heard that from your own child for several years. But happy Father's Day. Psalms 116.5. And I'll just challenge you to read Psalms 116. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Psalms 103.8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and bounding in love. And I want to finish with this. And my brother Glenn, I want you to start making your way up here. I want you to share something. I think it's very powerful. Exodus 34, 1-6. The Lord, then the Lord Moses says, Chis- uh, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. And I will write on them the same words that were on the tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one else may come with you. In fact, no one has appeared anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. So Moses chose out the two tablets of stone like the first ones. Early in the morning, he climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. He carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him. He called out his name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. See, in Exodus 33, Moses had asked God's glory. Reveal your glory to me, Father. In 34, here's God's response was he showed Moses his love. And his glory in that moment was revealed with compassion, mercy, love, faithfulness, forgiveness, and justice. He could have given Moses the power and the majestic vision and I am God and he can done all that. But no, he showed him the faithfulness and the justice and the mercy and the goodness of the Lord. So again, happy Father's Day. Because I'm going to tell you, man, you are a father every day. There is no days off as a father. There is no days off. Our Heavenly Father doesn't take a day off. We don't take a day off. If we want to imitate the likeness of our Father and Jesus, we don't take day off. Even though we're taking a day off of work, that means you're even more overtime with your family in that moment. Spend time with your family because you have a choice every day to serve, to love, encourage, respond, pay attention, display faith, and, and live in humility to make an impact in your children's lives. And I'm going to have Glenn here because last week me and Glenn had an opportunity to speak to one another, and he has a testimony that I said, man, this will be perfect for the fathers to hear because maybe there's someone like you in this, in this crowd that needs to hear the testimony like Glenn's. Well, it's powerful. So and after you to share your testament, I'm going to pray. And Ron, you can make your way up here. I'll I'll go ahead, brother. So, oh, yeah, you're going to use it for the... You got to use it? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, good. Well, please. No, you good, brother. So, I approached Damon after or, his spoke last time. And I told him how proud of him I was because he's 27 years old. My kids are 24, uh, 27, 29. And they've gone so far from the Lord and stuff. And I came to him, asked him, a prayer uh, for my kids to reach back out. And he prayed uh, long prayer, <laughs> long prayer. And um, it wasn't an hour and a half. My oldest son hadn't called me for a month, reached out and gave me a call, said, how you doing? And we talked for half an hour. I talked about his faith. Where it's going. It wasn't three hours later, my youngest son called. Mm. Both of which I had not heard from for a while. And it, it just impacted me. Mm. And I want to tell him how much it meant. Mm. So don't ever lose faith in where you're at mm. and where your kids are at. And uh, I mean, I've done something right. I got, I'm a fireman and my kids do it. My kids are firemen. Mm. So they're following my footsteps. Now, if they can just follow the Lord's footsteps, Amen. that's what they yeah. need to do. Mm. So thank you. So thank much. you so much, brother. Mm.
the reason why I share that is because I want him to come share that. Because someone maybe like you that I haven't heard from your kids for a while. But it takes faith and being vulnerable to another man and saying, my kids ain't going the way they should be going. And I need some help. And by us declaring and decreeing and submitting his children to the Lord, look what Lord, look what the Lord did within an hour and a half. In an hour and a half. And then four hours later, he got to talk to two of his kids. So Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for you as a good, good father for what you do for us as children, Lord. I pray as we celebrate and honor these fathers and grandfathers in this place today as they spend time with their loved ones this weekend. Lord, I pray for a moment, a bend down moment, that they're playing games or hanging out or having a conversation with their children. I pray that righteousness and pureness will be displayed and humility will be displayed and love will be displayed. But more importantly, God, that your presence will be among all the households represented in this place today. And Lord, we thank you, Father God, for your heart and for your love and for the mind that you allow us to continue to be better disciples so we can continue to dedicate our children and point them back to you, Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, man. Amen. Awesome.